Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're talking with Dr. Mitchell Miglas, Assistant Professor of Neurology at the Stanford Center for Autonomic Disorders at the Stanford University, about his experience treating patients with post-COVID syndrome or long-haul COVID. He's calling in from Palo Alto, California. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Miglas, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, early on in the pandemic, you began treating patients who had certain symptoms long after they recovered from COVID. Can you talk about, you know, describe what you're seeing? Sure. Uh, so we started seeing these patients um, around March and April of last year, and they were predominantly younger women presenting with the constellation of symptoms that we were used to seeing in autonomic medicine for many years, uh, that of POTS or postural tachycardia syndrome. While not all had POTS, uh, most of them developed symptoms after fairly mild COVID infection, and some of their symptoms emerged several weeks later. And predominantly, they were describing lightheadedness on standing, uh, racing hearts, feeling like they were going to faint, you know, as well as uh, cognitive issues they call brain fog, and of course, fatigue, and sometimes GI symptoms. It's, you know, obviously a lot of unanswered questions. Is there anything or any indications of why this might affect uh, younger female patients? Well, one theory is that, you know, this demographic is that that uh, is, is predisposed to um, autoimmune or immune-mediated reactions. Uh, we know from prior studies that POTS generally affects women, and it does tend to occur after a trigger. And even before COVID, uh, over 50% of our patients would describe viral uh, prodrome before their symptom onset. So, you know, autoimmunity is sort of the uh, more common um, mechanism or, you know, more recent mechanism that's that's been investigated in these patients. There are many other mechanisms, of course, but, um, but autoimmunity as it relates to COVID is one interesting uh, theory. You published a case study about one young woman's struggle with long-haul COVID. Can you tell us a little bit about that case and, you know, what do you, what do you learn from it? Yeah, so so that case was uh, a, a very very kind of classic case of POTS in many ways, and some some parts of it were atypical. Uh, that patient was a, a nurse, an ER nurse, who had um, somewhat mild symptoms initially. She never required hospitalization for her COVID infection or SARS-CoV-2 infection, and then her autonomic symptoms developed after those initial sort of para-infectious. COVID symptoms improved. And two to three weeks later was when she started to develop more of the autonomic features. And in her case, I'd say what was a bit atypical was uh, she would she would have more of these, what we call as hyperadrenergic surges, which we do see in some patients with POTS, but I, I've seen it more in, in the post-COVID dysautonomia patients. So there's increased sympathetic activation. Some of them develop new onset hypertension. Uh, or they can develop orthostatic hypertension. So that not only their heart rate goes up, but their blood pressure goes up when they stand. And they just get these spells that, um, you know, can be confused as panic attacks, just sort of uh, fight or flight responses that are probably autonomic in nature. You kind of, uh, I guess, described POTS as a systemic condition. You know, are there any other kind of symptoms you're seeing? Of course. So, you know, obviously fatigue is very prominent. The cognitive impairment is extremely um, and disabling for most patients. We don't understand why that is. Um, it's probably not just related to blood flow to the brain. It's probably something else systemic, whether that's inflammation or not, we don't know. A lot of patients can um, develop these GI dysmotility symptoms. So they may have constipation or diarrhea. You know, the autonomic nerves, uh, innervate the entire you know, gastrointestinal system. And some patients develop new onset pain. They might develop small fiber neuropathy, and that's been reported after other viral infections. That So the virus can cause damage to the small nerves in the skin and elsewhere and cause um, you know, various burning type pains. And then some patients develop new allergies um, and are diagnosed with mast cell impairment. And you know, there is a, a very strong link, I think, between autoimmune you know, conditions autonomic dysfunction, and also allergic allergic function. It is kind of mysterious, that range of, you know, different uh, 
I guess, symptoms that are playing out. Um, you know, when you think about uh, or have seen, you know, based on the one year of this under your belt, are you seeing any successful approaches to, you know, treating such a wide range of symptoms? You know, we're we're still in the very early stages of, you know, let alone understanding this, but even thinking about how to treat it. I mean, right now we're we're approaching this just as we would approach most of patients with POTS. Again, not all patients with post-COVID uh, dysautonomia have POTS, but uh, the the general paradigm is is try to find some medications that control the symptoms and maybe stabilize at least uh, say they're orthostatic symptoms so they are less lightheaded and they can be more physically active, you know, treat other components like sleep disorders, migraine, et cetera. And then once that's a little better control, then we start thinking about a very gentle physical rehabilitation program. Uh, caveat there is some patients with this syndrome may have more post-exertional malaise like a typical chronic fatigue syndrome patient would. And in that case, we don't really want to push the exercise too much because that can cause crashes and, and backsliding in their in their therapy. So, you know, this is why we need the studies. And, you know, thankfully, the NIH has allocated funding and hopefully that'll be, you know, what we're doing in the next year. You know, I was just reading uh, about another study and uh, one of the physicians quoted in the article talked about how for patients that start to experience these long COVID symptoms, you know, the first kind of visit to... Uh, you know, their primary care physician kind of kicks off an odyssey, perhaps, of other visits because, you know, maybe these uh, different kind of symptoms are being viewed individually. When you, you know, when you think about what advice you could give to physicians when someone kind of comes in and presents with this, how, wh what kind of advice would you give them on the best course of action? Yeah, it's a very important question. And I know it's something the, the CDC is working on with, with a small task force you know, that we're involved in and creating some interim guidance for primary care physicians, because that's going to be the first line and, you know, providers treating these patients. And, you know, we have to be careful not to fragment the care too much and just refer to a dozen subspecialists for all these various symptoms. Um, I think probably involving, uh, you know, various um, therapists early, whether that's PT, OT, um, you know, psychotherapists, a lot of patients develop pretty significant, you know, anxiety from depression from this. Think about involving those, you know, other you know, providers earlier. And, um, you know, and then if patients do meet criteria for certain other conditions, say maybe POTS, I'd say if from an autonomic perspective, um, if patients are describing lightheadedness, all doctors should be thinking about just doing a simple orthostatic stand tests in the office, measure blood pressure, heart rate, supine, you know, laying flat, and then after a few minutes of standing and, and seeing if there's clear abnormalities there. Um, but we have to be careful not to, you know, subdivide and segment their care with subspecialty referral that can really kind of delay the, the process of them getting seen. Who, let me just ask, who should they be referring folks that kind of indicate those types of uh, those types of symptoms you described after an examination like that? Yeah, I think, you know, the first step is really ruling out uh, any organ damage, or any, you know, kind of more um, serious sequelae of, of COVID. Uh, you know, we know some patients can develop um, microemboli, some patients may have small PEs, um, cardiomyopathy or myocarditis. So, um, you know, there are various blood tests, which, you know, there, there's no protocol for this, but, you know, we typically check a, you know, D-dimer and you make sure that patients don't have a clear uh, cardiac or pulmonary damage from their infection. Might be worth referring some of those patients to cardiologists or pulmonologists. And then if that's not the case, uh, you know, if they do have these autonomic symptoms, there are not many centers that do treat this, um, you know, and, and there are some there's some literature on there out there for primary doctors, you know, that can help with treatment. And we are developing, um, you know, multidisciplinary care center at Stanford at the moment, you know, as other institutions have, and hopefully with, with more of these institutions and centers becoming available, there'll be more resources for, you know, primary care to refer uh, if, if the patient is a bit more complicated. 
Yeah, I had a guest on from the Atlantic Health System uh, on the in the in the East Coast uh, that set up kind of a post-COVID recovery center, so to speak, where that kind of integrated treatment is given. Is that kind of a trend that you see at least kind of developing? Yes, I mean, I think it's 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 a very important trend, and um, I think to to carry that forward and to build that, you know, ultimately we we need funding, and I think, you know, this first step that the NIH has taken with um, trying to create uh, some patient hubs and patient registries, uh, I think will encourage that. So not only can um, we care for patients in a multidisciplinary way, but we can, you know, collect this data in a, in a harmonized way and try to kind of determine what works and what doesn't for you know, trials and, uh, and such going forward. It seems also too. This is just a, yet another reason why uh, young people need to get the get their vaccines, um, because this is just uh, obviously a, you know a heavy uh, possible outcome for those that would endure something like this. Um, you're obviously you know uh, a year under your belt now, and like so many of the things that we're still learning. And in fact, you are now doing your own study. Can you tell us what that research looks like? Sure. Uh, so, you know, we just started with uh, an online global survey um, about a about a year ago. We partnered with um, Lauren Stiles at Stony Brook University, and you know the questions we asked were uh, pretty much you know all questions related to COVID symptoms, um, not specifically focusing on dysautonomia, but we also included autonomic survey scores. You know, quality of life scores, and um, you know, we're we're just doing the first cut of that data now, and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to publish soon on it. You know, at this point, we had over we have over four thousand uh, participants for this online component, and then filtering that down, you know, we're just including patients that had a confirmed positive SARS-CoV-2 test. You know, a lot of these patients early in the pandemic did not have access to testing. And that's another gap, you know, that in in the data here. But you know, just including those who had confirmed testing, you know, we came out with about 700 or so patients. And what we found is, um, you know, mo the majority, 80 percent, were not hospitalized. Uh, the mean age is around 40 to 50 years of age. 85 percent are women, and their 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 mean autonomic scores are somewhere on on level of um, moderate to severe disability, you know, something similar to what we would see in a, in a moderately progressive neurodegenerative disorder, uh, some of which require wheelchair, um, you know, assistance. So, you know, the, the disability on the autonomic side is, is fairly prominent. And, you know, the importance is that, the important point there is, you know, it's predominantly women and the initial infection tends to be quite mild at least from what we've seen. You know, the next phase, which we're also developing, is to, you know, do objective autonomic testing on these patients and do several markers of, you know, immune function and blood tests and, and see if we can somehow detect some signal where, you know, that would indicate which patients are predisposed uh, to developing, you know, this, this long COVID syndrome. Do you feel like you have the funding, at least initially, for what needs to happen kind of uh, on an ongoing basis? We don't have the funding. Uh, to carry this, you know, at the moment, um, longitudinally. I mean, we just have a cross sec funding for a cross sectional study of maybe 20 patients, and um, but hopefully, you know, this next phase of of funding that's you know at least being stimulated by the NIH will will, will give us more opportunities, um, and uh, you know, for, and, and looking at various other funding sources, you know, we hope to kind of expand this and. And of course, collaborate with other centers that are interested, uh, very interested, and anyone that you know wants to collaborate with us on this. Well, uh, Dr. Miklos, thank you so much for being here today, and uh, for all the uh, work that you and your colleagues are doing. I hope that your research does uh, help shed some light on what is truly a pretty painful aftermath for a lot of folks here. That's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll be back soon with another segment. In the meantime, for resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.